This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Palestinians did not delay in responding to the Israeli massacres in Gaza. Last night's operation against the seminary religious school, the yeshiva in West Jerusalem, probably carried the message that for each action, there is a reaction. Israel quickly and completely sealed off the West Bank and arrested several friends and family members of Allah Abu Dahim, who carried out the operation. Israeli Defense Minister Hud Barak postponed his visit to Washington and joined the inner cabinet to discuss the measures to be taken in response response to the operation. Shuruk Assad reports from occupied Jerusalem. As usual, instead of looking at the reasons behind the Palestinian operation, Israel looks at ways to continue its military tactics. In occupied Jerusalem, tight security measures inside the city prevented thousands of Palestinians from reaching the Aqsa Mosque. Shock and fear surrounded the religious school where the operation took place a school that graduates hundreds of extremist religious Jews who call for the killing of Arabs. The operation shook the Israelis and added a new security failure for Israel. The person who carried out the attack, Ala Abu Dhim, dressed up as a religious Jew and carried a carton filled with bullets, passing easily in front of Israeli intelligence and surveillance cameras in Jerusalem. Clearly, the Israelis were expecting a reaction after their operation in Gaza, but they did not expect the kind of response they received yesterday. Defense Minister Barak canceled his trip to Washington to conduct extensive talks concerning security with Almers and army chiefs. The Israeli foreign minister began making international calls against President Abbas and his efforts at maintaining security. They are laying the groundwork to continue their operations against the West Bank and Gaza. Israel does not want a solution, reconciliation or negotiations with any of the Palestinians. This operation provides them with a new opportunity to draw back in the peace process. Strangely, Almert insists on holding President Abbas responsible, even though he participates in undermining the Palestinian president's power. Almert knows very well that Abbas has no control over Jerusalem, the West Bank, or the Gaza Strip. Shuruq Asad, Dubai TV, occupied Jerusalem. Outrage, shock, and mourning in Israel today following last night's massacre of eight high school and yeshiva students at the Merkaz Harav Yeshiva in Jerusalem. Thousands gathered at the seminary today to bid farewell to the eight, whose bodies were laid out on the same benches in the courtyard they used during Bible study at the time of their murders by a lone Palestinian gunman. The victims have been identified as Yochai Livshitz, aged 18 of Jerusalem, Yonatan Itzchak Eldar, 16 of Shiloh, Yonadav Chaim Hirschfeld, 19, of Kochav HaShachar, Neria Cohen, 15, also from the capital, Rowi Roth, 18, of Elkana, Sagev Peniel Avichail, 15, of Neve Daniel, Avram David Moses, 16, of Efrat, and Doron Maharita, 26, of Ashdod. The mother of victim, Avram David Moses, said that God sees her son as, quote, an angel, and we should thank him for the privilege of raising Avram for 16 years of purity, integrity, and kindness. Seminary head Rabbi Yaakov Shapira eulogized his students, saying, You are the Holy of Holies. You are the Yeshiva, the dear sons of Zion. Along with the rabbis and other yeshiva heads, several Knesset members also attended today's ceremony, after which the eight students were laid to rest in their own communities across the country. 
Last night's attack was perpetrated between 8.45 and 9 o'clock. It was carried out by 20-year-old Allah Abu Dain from East Jerusalem. The shooting rampage ended when an alert army captain, himself a former student at the yeshiva, heard the gunshots from his nearby home and he ran to the site where he stormed the building and killed the terrorist. IBA's Eli Wogelenter brings us the details of last night's tragedy. The massacre in Jerusalem's Erkaz Harav Yeshiva last night occurred at around 8.45 when a lone gunman entered the seminary. He made his way to the library where about 80 students had gathered to celebrate the beginning of the festive Hebrew month of Adar II. The gunman pulled out an automatic weapon and began firing round after round of ammunition in every direction. Some students hid under their desks and locked themselves in classrooms to avoid being caught in the hail of bullets while others jumped out the window to escape. Eyewitnesses estimated that the gunman shot off some 500 to 600 bullets in a barrage that lasted for several minutes. The gunman was shot twice by a student at the yeshiva who had crawled onto an adjacent ledge. An off-duty IDF officer who lived nearby and who had himself attended Merkazarov heard the sound of the shooting and rushed to the building. He then shot and killed the gunman. Eight students were killed in the attack seven of them teenagers, and ten were wounded. Three of the wounded are still in critical condition, one was moderately wounded, and six sustained light injuries. Rescue workers recounted a grisly scene. There were horrendous screams of help us, help us, said a member of the Zaka Emergency Rescue Service, one of the first to respond to the attack. There were bodies strewn all over the floor, at the entrance to the yeshiva, in various rooms, and in the library. Another paramedic said he saw several dead yeshiva students on the library's floor. Some of them were still holding sacred Jewish books smeared with blood from which they were learning before they were murdered, he said. Welcome to the end of the week and today's issues. In the first hour, we discussed the political angle of the situation in Gaza. We continue our Gaza discussion, but from another angle. A Palestinian woman was traumatized when she approached a place that she could not even look at. She had lost her son there a few days ago. An Israeli missile hit him and his cousins while they were playing soccer, turning them into dismembered body parts. At first, we did not understand why the mother was terrified by this place and could not even look at it, but then she told us her story. A few days ago, her young son Omar's body was dismembered by an Israeli missile that killed him and three of his cousins while they were playing soccer. When the missile hit, I ran out of the house. I found them like a pile of meat, and my son was there, thrown by the wall. I didn't recognize him. I called his name, Omar, Omar. I did not recognize him. With one missile, Israel caused a group tragedy in this small neighborhood, killing children and leaving others confused with tear-filled eyes. Those who were spared from physical wounds were not spared from mental injuries. Some were spared of neither, like little Ali, who was injured in his stomach and his head, and most likely his future has also been injured. He fell next to me on his head. He was hurt, his face was burned. They wrapped him up. Children in Gaza are the heroes born out of the carnage created by the Israeli army in the Gaza Strip. If they were not dead, their tears would have filled the clinics, but with their death, they fill it with their bodies and blood. Some of them died under crumbled homes like this newborn infant who only needed his father's arms to carry him to his grave. Some of them, however, were targeted intentionally. My oldest son said he was going up to the bathroom. As he was lifting his knees, he was shot through the window. The Jews. I did not know that Jewish special forces were in the building. They shot him. 
My daughter saw the blood, and as she lifted her head off the pillow, they shot her in the mouth. I saw the blood spilling out. This elderly man sits to tell his grandchildren the story of migration to the Jabalia camp in the Gaza Strip. The children listen, but it is already known that their story will be different. That is, if their fate is to live and tell their story. Now it's now known that at least 68 people were killed by twin bomb blasts in central Baghdad's commercial district on Thursday. It was the worst attack in the Iraqi capital since last June, and it came on the same day that the U.S. military said a brigade of 2,000 soldiers was leaving Baghdad and would not be replaced. Mike Hanna reports. Daylight made clear the enormity of the twin bombing attack, the cleanup of the massive damage underway. The bloodstains on the ground are a reminder that more than 50 people were killed instantly. And with more dying in hospital overnight, the death toll continues to rise. Well over 120 people injured in what was clearly a carefully planned operation. The first explosion occurring just after half past eight in a crowded market at the beginning of the weekend. The second, a few minutes later, the work of a suicide bomber who'd waited for the crowd to swell around the wounded and the dead before detonating the blast. In the past week, as many as 250 people have died in violence in Iraq the vast majority civilians. This is a continuation of a dangerous trend that appears to indicate a rise in violence. Last month, there were 30% more violent deaths than in January. But still, the authorities contend that overall the security situation is vastly improved as compared to a year ago. But statistics matter little to those who continue to bury their dead or to a father who has lost his son. My son is dead, what more can I say, he says. My son is dead and it has broken my heart. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Baghdad. The relationship between Syria and Iran has witnessed further cooperation based on the two countries' shared perspective on the region's issues. They share the concern of maintaining security and stability and schemes of obstruction that aim to control the area, divide it and rob it from its resources. The relationship between Syria and Iran took off after the victory of the Islamic Revolution in Iran with a shared concern for Arab issues beginning with Palestine. The basis of this relationship was established by the late president Hafez al-Assad and the supreme leader of the Islamic Revolution in Iran, Ayatollah al-Khomeini. The relationship was established based on the principles of protecting the welfare of the people and the countries in the area. The Syrian and Iranian leaders strive to face the dangers and challenges and to maintain security and stability. They have matching policies that support the path of resistance and stand in the face of occupation and offensives in Palestine, Lebanon and Iraq. In light of the current events in the region, the two countries under the leaderships of President Bashar al-Assad and Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad aim to make their economic ties as strong as their unique political ties, which are based on mutual respect. Syria stood by Iran in the face of external pressures and supported Iran's right to peaceful nuclear technology. In turn, Iran stood by Syria in the face of ongoing pressures by the United States, which are due to the positions taken by Damascus and Iran, which reject the policy of supremacy and the powers that aim to single-handedly control the region. The two countries also agree on the use of dialogue and diplomacy to resolve international disputes. On the economic front, Syria benefited from Iran's advancements in industry. Two car factories have been established in Damascus and Hims, as well as cement factory in Hama. In turn, Iran benefited from the investment opportunities in Syria. The joint Syrian-Iranian High Commission meets today to strengthen and solidify the relationship between the two countries in all areas.
Do you think that the American voter will be influenced by issues related to al-Qaeda, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Iran? Mm. I think the American voters will be influenced more by issues related to al-Qaeda than what is happening in Iraq. Al-Qaeda caused what happened in New York and the World Trade Center. I think this will have more of an effect than the war in Iraq. The number of American soldiers killed in Iraq is relatively not very large for the United States. The United States is a large nation. Some people have started saying that the U.S. is losing and that another Vietnam is unfolding in Iraq. Yes, the numbers are not as large as in Vietnam, but the U.S. can't continue to bear this burden in the 21st century. Even Bush was eventually forced to change his policy in Iraq. Of course, it has been proven that there were many mistakes with the United States policy in Iraq. The mistakes were unexpected because the United States policy was not thought out. In reality, they were surprised, but I still believe that any other American president would have faced the same events in Iraq. What happened is that the United States lost control over what was happening on the ground. Do you think that the U.S.'s policy in Iraq will not be changed regardless of whether a Republican or Democratic candidate is elected? I think there will be no change. <laughs> Professor Ahmad Asfahani, do you agree? I think there will be change. For example, the Senate made a decision to reconsider a new bill that specifies a timetable for withdrawal of American forces in Iraq. The legislator who introduced this said that there is no hope that such a bill can be approved before the elections. But it has become part of the American mindset. More importantly, it has become part of the election battle. The Democrats may have planned this as part of a conspiracy. They want to keep the issue of Iraq alive in the minds of voters so they are not only focused on the economic issues. It is known that the American economy is deteriorating, but the current American administration has also gotten involved in an important political problem, and the Democrats want to continue to play this card. Mm. I want to add something. The Republicans in particular say that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan keep the war on terror away from American and European territories. They believe that if the American forces were to withdraw, the Muslim extremists may take advantage of such an opportunity to take control of these areas, which will affect American and European security. The withdrawal of the American and European forces. Do Americans believe this? Yes. One last question for Professor Ahmad Asfahani. One candidate might be a threat to the Democrats, not the Republicans, presidential candidate Ralph Nader, who has Lebanese origins. He is leftist and supports environmental issues. Nader was accused of causing the Democrats to lose the election in 2000. Is this a conspiracy by Ralph Nader against the Democrats? This is not a conspiracy. We could call it a personal drive to become president. He may have contributed to the defeat of Al Gore in 2000 because Nader won 2,800,000 votes. However, in 2004, he won only 380,000 votes. Therefore, the Nader factor, which was effective in 2000 because he used many messages that spoke to American voters' concerns, such as helping the environment and empowering the weak. These messages were effective because Americans were tired of Republican and Democratic policies. They had tired of the donkey and the elephant. Yes, in 2000 they voted for Nader and this may have affected the elections. However, in 2004, Nader did not have the same influence. Again, I think his candidacy will not have an impact like it did in 2000. These elections are very important for the average American because this is the first time in modern history that economic issues are being linked to foreign policy issues. Therefore, the turnout will be strong and American voters will not waste their ballots by voting for Ralph Nader.
يصل إلى العاصمة التركية ظهر اليوم الرئيس العراقي جلال طلباني في أول زيارة. Iraqi President Jalal Talabani carried out his first visit to Ankara since he took office as the president of Iraq. This visit comes in the wake of the attack that was launched by the Turkish forces against PKK positions in northern Iraq. وتقول مصادر صحفية في أنقرة إنها. Turkish newspapers said that the Turkish army may launch new air raids on the region during President Talabani's visit to show that Turkey is opposed to negotiations with any Kurdish official. The visit of the Iraqi President Jalal Talabani to Turkey comes as Turkish-Iraqi relations became tense following the attack that was carried out by Turkey on the 21st of February 2008. Turkey said they attacked bases of the PKK in the Kurdish region of Iraq. However, the Kurdish regional government said that the attack might have been an attempt to fight independence sentiments in the region, which explains why the president of the Kurdish region in Iraq, al-Barazani, warned that targeting civilians will be countered with a comprehensive resistance. The Kurdish regional government was not the only concerned entity. The European Union was also concerned. The European Union High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy, Javier Solana, said that he understood understands the Turkish reasons behind the attack, but he does not believe that using force is the best way to resolve problems. The United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon expressed similar views when he requested that countries' borders not be attacked or used to launch terrorist attacks against other countries. In this context, Talibani will focus his visit to Turkey on the latest Turkish attack and other issues, such as compensating the citizens who were affected by the attack, as well as for the bridges that were destroyed in the Kurdish region. According to the Daily News the newspaper, there may have been a psychological barrier that prevented the former Turkish president, Ahmed Najdat Sizar, from inviting his Iraqi counterpart. Sizar was concerned that the Kurds in Iraq were planning to establish their own independent country. This psychological barrier is still present among Turkish army, which according to Turkish newspapers, may carry out attacks in the Kurdish region in Iraq during Talibani's visit to show their opposition to the meeting with any Kurdish official. In this context, it seems that no significant announcements will be made during Talibani's visit because it will only be one step down a long and rough road lined with thorns. There are strong national sentiments among the Kurds who want to establish their own independent state, which is perceived as a threat to the national unity of Turkey and other neighboring countries. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad received a red carpet welcome in Iraq, but his visit was barely covered in U.S. media. Who guaranteed his security in Iraq? And why is he smiling? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. Not long ago, Iranian President Ahmadinejad caused media frenzy in the U.S. when he came to New York to address the United Nations General Assembly. He also made the headlines when he visited Columbia University and received a tongue lashing from its president. Let's then be clear at the beginning. Mr. President, you exhibit all the signs of a petty and cruel dictator. In contrast, a beaming Mahmoud Ahmadinejad received a red carpet welcome this week as he became the first Iranian president to visit Iraq. His visit was barely covered in U.S. media and was hardly acknowledged by the Bush administration. Here is why. Ahmadinejad, whose country, the last time I've checked, is still a component of the axis of evil, flew into Baghdad through skies controlled by American air power. He and his entourage then traveled through roads secured by U.S. Marines to and from the airport. Welcomed by U.S.-backed Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, a triumphant Iranian leader told a joint press conference. The Americans have to understand the facts of the region. Iraqi people do not like America. But didn't President Bush recently go to the Middle East in order to isolate Iran from its neighbors? The outcome seems to be opposite of what Bush intended. It seems that Ahmadinejad has outmaneuvered President Bush at every stop he made in the region except for Israel. The Iranian president has been invited to Saudi Arabia as well as several Gulf states, and there seems to be a rapprochement between his country and Egypt. So why is Ahmadinejad smiling in Iraq? 
First, the U.S. has removed Iran's number one enemy in the region, Saddam Hussein and his Ba'ath party, and replaced them with a Shiite-dominated regime, several of whose key players spent time in exile in Iran. Now Iraq is on its way to becoming a major trading partner with Iran. The Iranian president has recently announced new initiatives with Iraq as a result of his two-day visit. He signed customs agreements, joint investment projects in oil ventures, construction of an airport near the Shiite holy city of Najaf for pilgrims, a free trade zone, integration of banking systems, exchange of technical expertise, and a $1 billion loan in the form of goods and services provided by Iranian companies. Meanwhile, U.S. officials continue to reiterate their belief that Iran had been arming and training militias and death squads who have been blamed for much of the sectarian war in Iraq. Iran was dangerous, Iran is dangerous, and Iran will be dangerous. Many in the Bush administration still believe that Iran has not halted its military nuclear program. In addition, the UN passed another resolution to impose more sanctions on Iran, which Iran's foreign ministry spokesman Mohammad Ali Husseini dismisses as worthless and unacceptable. The irony of it all is the fact that Iran has been called the main beneficiary of the Iraq conflict so often it is almost a cliché. Now it is a reality. I'm Jamal Dejani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mosaic. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wendy Hanamura, station manager here at Link TV. You know, recently we did a poll of some of you, our donors, and we asked you why you contribute to Link TV. I keep a binder of all your answers, and, and they're great. Here are some of them. No advertising, no commercials, no corporate strings, right? Not your average regurgitated empty news. The number one reason I watch and donate to Link TV is Mosaic. It's great to hear from you, and it's great that you support us. If you haven't yet done that, I invite you to do that now. A quick visit to our website or a phone call is all that it takes. It's fast and it's easy. Here's where you go. The website is linktv.org. Click on that green support button to see all of the options right now. You want to make your support count even more? Well, choose this option, the No Gifts Please option, to guarantee that 100% goes to what you value most on Link TV. If you prefer to call us, here's the number, 1-866-485-8848. And consider this budget-friendly option. Become a sustaining supporter. It's easy to do at linktv.org or when you call. You just have to have your credit card ready to set up automatic contributions in any amount that's right for you. Think of it as your subscription to documentaries, music, and news from around the world. To thank you for a $20 or more per month donation, we have the new Link TV duffel bag ready to send in thanks. Introduce people in your life to the insightful and one-of-a-kind programs you can see only here. Go to linktv.org right now or call us and make a $50 tax-deductible contribution and we'll send you the beautiful Link TV cards. Include a note to a friend about all that Link TV has to offer. When you contribute $100, we'll send you the cards plus the new Link TV travel mug. Yet another great way to spread the word. You know, each one of you and each dollar you pitch in makes a difference. Not everyone can give a lot at once, but if you can, please consider making a powerful $1,000 tax deductible contribution to Link TV. That's $1,000 that helps us buy more documentaries and more films to show all year to millions of Americans across the country. And in thanks, we're going to send you every single gift that we have mentioned during this entire fundraising period. It's a huge box full of DVDs, books, the Link TV gear, CDs, and more. Of course, the real gift, though, is that it guarantees that Link TV will be here when you need us, serving up the best documentaries, news, and music from around the world. So please help Link TV to continue to bring you independent media at its best. 
go online to linktv.org. Call us at 1-866-485-8848. And thank you. Thank you for supporting Link TV, television without borders. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.